Well, hey everyone, thanks for joining us today. My name is Ben and you're gonna hear from a friend of mine in just a moment, but hey, 2020 is just about over. I mean, if, if we're honest, uh, probably we've been over it since maybe like April, but it is finally coming to an end and I doubt anyone's very sad about that. Anybody sorry to see 2020 go? I didn't think so because you know, 2020, as we've been saying in recent weeks around here, it's just been like this long string of bad news. There's global bad news with fires and hurricanes and pandemics, and there's national bad news with political tension and, and all of that and, and the racial stuff. And, and then there's personal bad news with everything from delayed graduations to, you know, messed up schooling and, and uh, we're masked up and spread out and funerals postponed, just so many things. Wouldn't it wouldn't it be cool if we could just start fresh? I mean, you ever think about that? Like, just like, what if we could just erase it all and have a do-over in 2021, you know? And, 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 there's a, and there is a sense in which, you know, as we come upon a new year, it's kind of exciting and there's kind of this optimism and hope for the new year. But I think another side of us is pretty realistic and realizes that, you know, there's nothing that automatically changes in life just because we flip a calendar page, right? Like we moved from December 31 to January 1 and well, COVID is still with us to whatever degree. And, and we continue to live with the lingering impact of stuff that's happened this year. The consequences kind of carry forward. So just flipping a calendar page, like doesn't magically change everything. But, you know, around here, we love that Psalm 121, which, which says, we're going to lift our eyes up and we're going to ask, so where does our help come from? And the answer is, and our help comes from the Lord. Because 2021 won't automatically bring us a fresh start. But God can. God can. And as we come to the end of a bad news year, is anybody up for some good news, right? Let's go back in time and remember when the good news first came onto the scene and things were really messed up in a bad news world then too, right? A long string of bad news in ancient Palestine. They were waiting on God to show up and to do something. And it seemed like he was not going to do that. They had 400 years of just like dead end silence. But you know, just when we need it most, that's when God always comes through. And, and God sent an angel to messengers to announce good news to a bunch of scared shepherds. We've talked about this scripture every week, and I hope it just kind of resonates in your heart now. It's Luke 2, verse 10. The angel said, don't be afraid, because I bring you what? Good news that will bring great joy to all people. And then here's the key. The focus of this good news is the Savior. Yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem in the city of David. And friend, you know, God is still bringing good news through Jesus Christ. He's still doing it today. He's been doing it ever since that very moment. And so today's message, as we come to the end of the year, is really for all of us, especially for, for anyone who just feels like, man, I need a fresh start in 2021. Because I think we all kind of, you know, want that chance for a comeback, for, for, a, for a new beginning, Right? For some of us, if we can be real personal and specific, you know, the end of, of 2020 might find us at a real dead end. And maybe your dead end is kind of emotional, like, like you're just worn out. You know, you just, the, the exhaustion or the stress or the anxiety or whatever is just caught up to you and you're just like exhausted. Or maybe some of us have been hit hard financially with our, you know, in, in our business or our job or the money stuff kind of has you feeling like things are at a dead end. Or maybe your dead end is just about an uncertain future. You know, you, when you go to next year, you don't know what January, February, March is going to hold. And it's draining. Or maybe there's a relationship that's a dead end for you. Or maybe you've messed up or sinned or embarrassed yourself somehow. Or there's just a chaotic, out of control sense about your life where you know, I just can't keep living like this. That can feel like a dead end. Or, or whatever, whatever dream it is that's gone up in smoke. Or maybe whatever spiritual stuckness you feel right now, whatever dead end we're at, one way or another, we all long for a fresh start sometimes. We don't have to flip the calendar page and hope for the best, make a bunch of resolutions and put all of our, our hope in that. But the good news is that if God's in the picture, man, you, you, can't, you can't count him out. 
because of Jesus, whenever we're at a dead end, God can give us a fresh start. And that's, that's our, our message as we end this year. And it's actually a huge theme all the way through the Bible. Just think about it for a moment with me, right? So you got Moses, right? He had this great life. He's living in the palace in Egypt, but then he has these anger issues and he it boils over into violence. He kills a guy and he runs for his life. Now he's living a dead-end job in the dead-end desert, middle of nowhere. And that's when God finds him and says, Moses, I want to come into your life and use you in a special way. And he does. And Moses becomes the one, doesn't he, that helps God's people, Israel, get out of their dead end into a whole new, fresh start of their own. It's amazing. This is a theme all the way through. Noah, you know, he was this righteous guy. He's a hero. He trusts God, does the right thing, builds the ark, rounds up the animal and all that, right? But after the flood is over, one of the first things he does is he, he plants a vineyard and he gets stone drunk and he brings big disgrace on himself and his family. God gives him a do-over and another chance as well. And the good news is that, that God has put that beautiful truth about fresh starts right into the core of what we call the gospel. That means good news. And it's centered in Jesus, who in his own life had come to an abrupt and, and tragic end, right? They, they put him in that, that cave and they rolled the stone in front of it. And that stone is like a symbol of all the dead ends that we'll ever face, especially the biggest dead end of all, our death. It, it, that stone represented all of that. And in the darkness of those three days, the whole world is like groaning in darkness. And then when it seemed like all was lost, that's when... God sent another angel, just like he did 33 years earlier to the shepherds. And this time the angel basically said the same thing. Anybody up for some good news? He's not here. He's not dead. He is risen. And the life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ is what makes it possible for every one of us to have the hope of a fresh start in life, spiritually and in every other way. It's just a beautiful picture of good news. Ephesians 2 says it this way. Once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins. He's talking to, to people like us about how before you have God in your life, whether you know it or not, you're at the ultimate dead end. You were dead, like dead, dead. But then look at verse 4. And it says, but God, but God is so rich in mercy and he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when we were raised just like Christ was raised. God loves you so much that he's not going to leave you at a dead end. You trust in him and man, he can give you a fresh start. God's part of your story. Your story isn't over. So that's really good news that changes everything. In fact, 2 Corinthians says, we can look at our lives and everyone else's life differently. It says, if anyone belongs to Christ, they've become a new person. A new person. The old is gone and the new life has become. That's a beautiful picture of a fresh start. And it, it's never more clear than when you see it in a real life. So I want you to meet my dear friend, John, today. John, John uh, is known to many of you. You'll recognize him, I'm sure. You'll say, oh, that's Pastor John, you know. He, he's always helping others, and he's always got a smile on his face. He's an encourager to so many people, but that's kind of the new John, right? John has gone through a lot in his life and some fires and trials, and he's agreed to come and share his story. So welcome, John. Come on and, and join me here. And uh, John, as you know, um, John and I are great friends, and I, I love your story so much. And it just, this theme that we're talking about from the Bible about dead ends, man, we're talking about that. And, and I'm thinking, man, this is John's story. So thank you for, for being here just to talk to our mountain family and wherever, whoever else needs to hear this a little bit about your own story. So would you just share some of your story with sure. us? Sure. Um, thank you, Ben. Thanks for the opportunity. Um, so, so I always like to start off um, and just say, you know, my name is John. I'm an alcoholic and an addict in recovery, saved by Jesus. And by the grace of God, um, I'm not the person I was 30 years ago. Hmm. You know, um, my family, you know, growing up, I was the youngest of four and the baby in my family. And um, I never heard the word no. Hmm. You know, anything they could give me, they did. It didn't mean we had a lot, but anything that was afforded to me that they could, they gave me. Um, man, I just, there, there was just this thing about me that I always stole. I always lied. I always cheated. 
So that was before I ever picked up a drink. Mm -hmm. um, when I put alcohol and chemicals in my body, I stole a lot, I cheated. And even when I got sober, I stole a lot, I cheated. Um, and, and I would love to say it's a symptom of my disease and, and, and that made me do it, um, but it didn't. I mean, that's kind of who I was. I was very self-seeking. You know, I thought about me, you know, what would get John ahead? You know, um, whatever would benefit John is kind of really the way I lived my life. You know, um, I was told there was givers and takers and, um, and I was a taker. I mean, that's, that's what I was. That's kind of what I became. And I always think if you were in my life, the reason was to give me something. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's just the way, I mean, that's just my story. Yeah. So, so John, uh, did you have, did you have God in your life? Was there church in your background at all or? So, yeah. Um, so I, I went to a Catholic school, um, to eighth grade, no elementary. And my parents went to a Catholic church and, um, and I went, you know, and I remember going on Sundays and I really remember, um, don't know how old I was, maybe eight or nine. I remember going to confession for the first time or penance, maybe they called it and sitting with a priest and being honest. You know, and I wasn't an honest person. So like to be honest, took a lot of courage. And I remember leaving there and feeling punished. I miss grace. I miss forgiveness. I miss Jesus. Hmm. Um, and I'm sure it was there, but I missed it. You know, I just didn't get that. And, um, and it just kind of set me up. I think by the time I was a teenager, um, I've given up on church. You know, I kind of, you know, without Jesus, without forgiveness, without grace, um, I kind of knew I was going to burn. And um, I figured, hey, I'm going to live my life the way I want and do what I want without regards for anybody else. Yeah, why not go for it? You know? Yeah. John, so when and why did you start drinking? So I probably picked up my first drink of alcohol um, really young, maybe 12, 13 years old. Um, and the why, um, alcohol, I like to say alcohol worked. You know, it made me feel bigger, taller, stronger, smarter. I think it made me feel not like John. Mm. Whatever it did, it made me not feel like me. Mm -hmm. um, the problem is I always wanted more. Yeah. So, and alcohol wasn't enough. So, you know, it led to, you know, um, marijuana and pills. And, and, um, and I have an older brother. I had an older brother who was the black sheep of the family. You know, he was the guy in and out of jail. He was the guy that caused grief and heartache that I was ashamed and embarrassed of. He was the heroin addict of the family. And um, he was the guy I would become. You know, he was the one I would follow. And um, by the time I was 19 years old, um, I wound up on this methadone program um, in the city away from where I lived. I like to say that because I was so embarrassed and ashamed of who I was and what I was doing. Um, I didn't want to go where people knew me, even though people knew, yeah. you know, and um, I traveled to you know, a city away. And um, man, I always say God really does things for a reason. And, um, you know, my life consisted of like me and my brother or me and myself. And um, I had a counselor at this program and, and, and this program was a 21 day program. So the thought was 21 days and you would be free. And, um, and that didn't work for me. You know, it was 21 days over and over and over because I always did what I did and I always got what I got. You know, so that you'd go sound. in, do the 21 days and then you'd go back and- it'd... And I would just stay, I would never even leave. I would never make it out. You know, I would just continue on this cycle and um, man, God really, um, I mean, you know, he knows us and he knows me. And, and, and my counselor happened to be a very attractive woman. Hmm. And um, so there was no attractive women in my life. There was nobody. And um, I remember every day I would just go and sit there and gaze and listen to this person. And she would always tell me, you know, John, you're, you know, you're too young and you need help. And you need to go home and tell your family you need help and you need to go to a rehab. And um, I was always too something. You know, I was always too smart, too quick, too slick. Um, and, and I didn't, you know, and then one day um, the pain got great enough. So it was, no, it was just an ordinary day, but whatever happened that day, I think I woke up and I went there and the pain was great enough and I was willing to listen. You know, and I sat there and um, I remember going home and talking to my family and telling my father I had a problem with alcohol because alcohol was really acceptable in my house. You know, alcohol was not a big thing. And, um, I have a don't worry, we'll take care of it kind of family. And, um, and I said, I, I don't think so. I think I really need help, you know, at that time. Yeah. So you're 19 
and um, the pain gets great enough and you say something else has to happen here. You, you, um, you, do, the, you do the detox, but then um, now you're going into rehab and it, and it was a psychiatric hospital, right? Was that, was that hard? Yeah, so, um, yeah, so in detox, you know, um, you hear everybody, you know, obviously they want you to go to rehab, you know, they want you to get healthy. And, um, you know, people are getting like 21 day programs, <laughs> 28 day programs. And I remember they offered me a 42 day program. And um, I was like, you know, I'm 19 years old and, and I think I'm going to die. Yeah. You know, so when you not have no hope and you don't think you're going to live, man, 42 days is a long time. And um, I was scared and um, I didn't know what to do, uh, but I said yes. I was too scared to say no. And, um, and, and, I, and you know, I thought a rehab would be like, um, you know, a beach in Florida and palm trees and swimming pools and weight rooms. And um, yeah, I wound up in Rockland Psychiatric Hospital. You know, um, God always gave me what I needed. And you're there and God has a way of working through really bad circumstances. I mean, these are like the worst events of your life. And yet it's kind of where we start to see like God getting you on a path. I mean, you had hepatitis and, and yeah. all this horrible stuff is happening to you there. And, and yet um, that's where you meet your sponsor and you start kind of getting on a journey to recovery on the surface things start kind of looking up for you is that right yeah i mean i mean yeah on the, on the surface i mean i would say my ambitions in rehab were um you know a good job <laughs> a nice car maybe a sports car and like the pretty girlfriend you know like that's what i wanted that was my ambition you know and um and i got him you know i found you know my father worked my father got me a city job and i found that if you worked and didn't blow all your money you could actually buy things you know new concept and, um, and I bought the little red sports car that I parked outside of everywhere I went, you know, because that was, that was my ego. And, um, and I met the girl, you know, and um, but what happened is every time one of these things happened, I used again. You know, and it was like a four month window and I used again and another four month window and I used again. And I just found myself falling back into the same thing I just left, um, kind of out of control. You know, so one of the last times I, I used, I say, um, I was with who I didn't want to be with, where I didn't want to be, doing what I didn't want to do. And I really had no control. Mm -hmm. I couldn't say no anymore. Yeah. So you're kind of heading toward that ultimate destruction again. And yet, uh, again, there's little these shafts of grace and light coming in. There's a sponsor. There's a, there's a community that starts to form a group. Tell us about, about that. Yeah, so, um, so, um, so my, last, my last drink was June 24th of 91. And... Um, you know, I can tell you, it was a Monday night. I know exactly where I went, the basement of the church, because, um, you know, I would never go anywhere but the basement of a church at that time. And um, I sat in the back row, intoxicated, um, feeling sorry for myself. I was always good to point at people and judge them. Um, that's just one of my things. And um, I finally felt what it was like on the other side. You know, but um, people did something that night. The community surrounded me. You know, they drove my car home for me. They took me out to the diner. They didn't leave me. They didn't judge me. They didn't leave me. And they kind of took me in, you know, and um, yeah, and I would meet my sponsor, you know, my sponsor, that would be my sponsor for the next almost 30 years then. And, um, you know, I was told things like if I did these five things a day that I wouldn't drink, you know, if I hit my knees in the morning and asked for the obsession to be lifted, if I read some literature, if I hit my knees at night, uh, if I called him or another recovering person, um, that I wouldn't drink again. And, and, and it worked. I mean, like these five things worked. Um, in hindsight, I don't know who or what I was praying to. You know, in hindsight, I don't know where my hope was because um, I, I didn't have a relationship with Jesus at the time, you know, but um, I prayed. And, and, and sometimes for me, praying was plotting. You know, man, I hit my knees and then I would just give God a list of how I wanted my day to go, what I wanted. And then sometimes at the end of my list, I'd say, you know, I will be done. Um, but I really didn't mean that. I really meant, hey, God, hook me up because he was like my vending machine. You know, like if he just gave me what I needed, um, I would do good. That was, that was my relationship with God at the time. You know, I, I knew God loved. So I always knew God existed and I knew God loved everyone because I thought that was his job. I just didn't think he liked me because he really knew who I was, what I did and what I became. So you've got this sense that God doesn't like you. 
you're probably kind of ashamed of yourself, but on the surface, some things are starting to come together. You're on a journey now toward recovery, right? Did, did things work for you or what happened next? Yeah, yeah. I mean, so, you know, days became weeks and weeks became months and months became years. Um, you know, I excelled at my job. I met, you know, the woman of my dreams, my wife, Pam, and my stepdaughter, Faye. I had a son, my firstborn, Jade. And, um, you know, life was good. You know, life was good. I mean, I was living, I say I was living a dream. You know, everything on the outside was getting better. You know, um, probably about 10 years in, um, you know, I'll share about my brother about 10 years in. So on my 10th anniversary, um, my brother, um, there was a time that he did get sober, um, but due to addiction, due to what he did, um, you know, he lost his life. And, and I just could tell you at my 10th anniversary, I was in a funeral parlor in Florida and it consisted of, my brother was a week shy of 40 years old it was me and my wife, my 70 year old parents and their friends. And there was no community. You know, he had nobody in his life. And it was a day, it was really sad, but it was a day to look back and see how important having community really is at that time. And um, yeah, it was kind of a wake up call for me, I think. So it's a wake up call. What did it wake you up to? I mean, what did it make you feel like? What, what did you conclude from some of those things? So just how important how important community is, how important relationship is, how important, you know, giving and being involved and helping others on um, the way people help me were, yeah. you know, that it stopped being a transaction. Mm -hmm. I've always been transactional, you know, uh, quid pro quo. Now you do for me, I'll do for you. And I just realized um, what a blessing it was to give and to give life to people. Mm -hmm. So John, it's that, that quest, that community that came around you was a big piece. And I've also heard you just say, this was also ironically one of the hardest times of your life. Um, the hepatitis that you thought was long past comes back, it starts attacking your liver and you go through some treatments and this, tell about that period and what it brought to light inside of you during that time. So yeah, so I'm, I'm about 13 years sober, it's about 2003 and um, the hepatitis from, you know, 14 years prior, really starts affecting me. And um, I had an opportunity to get on to treatment, which was a really year long treatment. And um, it was a really difficult time. It was a really lonely time. And I mean, I still had a family who loved me. I had a job you know, a business. Um, there was just something inside in that year, like a longing, that hole. So I always had a hole. I just didn't know what I was searching for. Um, I didn't know what I was longing for but it was probably the loneliest year of my life. I just was searching for something. Um, I just didn't know it was God. You know, um, later on, if I found Jesus, I would say, I didn't know I was lost till I was found because I wasn't searching for religion. I wasn't searching for relationship, but I was longing. I had that desire. I just didn't know what I was longing for. It sounds like you hit a dead end again. Yeah, I mean, so we would, I would say, at 14 years sober, you know, my first dead end was probably at 19, going to rehab. And at 14 years sober, I hit another one, like an emotional dead end, you know? And um, I didn't know I was, like I said, I was searching, I was looking. I didn't know what, what I needed, what would fill this void. Because on the outside, everything was great. You know, I had kids and a business and a family and life beyond my wildest dreams, but there was still a part of me that was missing. You know, I still had that hole in my soul mm -hmm. that was missing. And um, so my wife, about 2005, um, asked me to go to church one day. And um, I don't know why I said, yeah. I mean, I don't know what I did on Sundays, um, but it wasn't like, oh man, let me go to church. But I said, yes. And I walked into this little church and I heard about a relationship with Jesus. Yeah. You know, I heard about forgiveness, I heard about grace. I heard that Jesus died on the cross for John Rachapi. Yes, for everybody, but for me. And it was like, I always say, like, I always thought, like, is this real? Like, could this Jesus thing be real? Am I missing something? And it just started a relationship, um, an intimate relationship. I mean, I remember a pastor said that God desired a relationship that me and him would share, that'd be just the two of us. And I never looked at God like that because I didn't think God liked me. So why would he want something with just me? And, um, yeah, and it just drew me in. I started to want more. 
I love this part of the story, John, because I, I love how you, you talk about how you weren't even sure what was going on at the time, but you were hungry for more. What do you say? You, you were hungry for more. Yeah. You always wanted more of everything, but this was finally a good thing. Yeah, you yeah. So, so yeah. Th this was a good more. Yeah. So my more. mores in the past have been negative mores, like nothing's been enough. Yeah. Um, but something with Jesus just caught me, yeah. you know, started the change in me. Um, I, I, so my, my church started like a little recovery group and there was three of us. And um, we were supposed to prepare for the people that were coming and nobody showed up for two years. And for two years, three of us met weekly. But what I found out later on is God was preparing me because he was forcing me to be in his word. It was forcing me to do devotionals. It was, I was opening the Bible and I was starting to change without knowing it. And um, you know, the words that came out of my mouth were a lot cleaner. You know, they were naturally cleaner. And I grew up with um, not a clean mouth. And um, I think the big one was I had a, a business partner, a little English guy, um, he was an atheist. And I remember he said to me, I like you better on Thursday because you're too nice on Monday. And um, I guess- that, What did he mean? What I guess the mean? sermon wore off by Wednesday. I guess Monday- <laughs> You were more of a Christ follower on Monday, <laughs> Yes, huh? yes. And by Thursday, I was probably back to my old self. That's why I'm good for like a midweek study. Um, but um, yeah, Monday and Tuesday, I was different because the word was starting to be in me. And then, um, yeah, I guess, I guess by Thursday, I was, I was kind of back, but I remember him saying that. And it always took somebody else showing me where I was because I couldn't see the change in myself. Right. Yeah. So John, then by the providence of God, you end up here at Mountain. Uh, what was one of the first things you did? Oh, so yeah, so um, this is probably about 2012. And um, I started coming to Mountain and um, I, I want to come to a men's group. You know, and, um, and, and I always remember, you know, my friend Larry, I said, hey, man, let's go together. I'll pay for you. We'll sit in the back. And um, if it's not good, we'll leave. You know, like we'll sneak out the back door, right up for a bad dinner. And um, it was men's 33 series. You know, and um, we came in a cook and it was 200 guys there. It was a little overwhelming. And then there was a point where everybody broke down the tables. And um, seven of us were left without a table. You know, seven odd cats, I'd say. And... Um, we kind of joined together in the back of Cook Auditorium. We called ourselves the backseaters and we would stay together for like the next couple of years. You know, we would be community for each other. So we would do studies together. We would go to weddings together. We'd be at funerals to support each other. And we just stayed together. And I found out kind of what community was. I found out that I grow better and closer to Jesus when I'm with people than when I'm John by himself at home. And I just got that that catch, that community caught me, that Jesus caught me um, when I'm with people, when I say yes to people. And yeah, it was just um, really good. And then it just kind of, yeah, rolled from there. You know, it's just been, I just always learn to say yes. You know, I always learn just to say yes, because I never knew what God wanted from me next. Um, but I just, as long as I say yes and I kind of keep going, um, he always provides a way. Yeah. One of the ways you say yes to God is saying yes to a group and to yeah. people. Yeah. yeah, being in community. I mean, that same community feeling I had in the 12-step program, I mean, you know, those were my people, is what I found in church. You know, these were my guys. You know, these were the guys that were gonna show up when I need somebody. And in return, I would show up for them. So being a person that, um, you know, I told you I was a taker. So giving my time, because I actually cared about people, was, you know, evidence of Jesus in my life. Yeah. You know, really caring about people. You know, not because I was going to get something, not because it benefited John, just because this is what God wanted me to do. Yeah, yeah. it was really, really a cool experience. Yeah, that's awesome. Mm. John, thank you so much for not only just living the life you have, but for sharing it with us. And man, this is so important for every one of us to hear, isn't it? That, that, that just as we saw in John's life, man, it's happened again and again and again and again through, through so many people's lives. And when we feel like we're at an absolute dead end and you may feel like John said, too scarred or you're too far gone or you're too old or it's too late. Man, if you're still breathing, it's not too late. So no matter how messy your life has become, it, it, it's not too late for God to work a miracle just like we could say happened in John's life and he will meet you exactly where you are right now, as John said. So 
We don't know everything that the next year is gonna bring, but we know this, that if God is in your life, you can have a new start. Not because the calendar page turns, but because of the power and the presence of Jesus Christ in your life. So, and no matter where you are with the Lord, um, this is a moment right now. Uh, I just love the, John's urgency just to say, God, I wanna surrender my sadness, my stuckness, my sin to you. Um, Jesus, with, with your tender compassion as my Savior and as the King of the universe, will you just do for me what you did for John, for Ben, and so many others as I surrender my life to you? I hope as you've prayed that prayer, God will, will meet you. I know he will. Amen. Amen.